Today we're going to talk about how to set yourself up for the best chance of success in photography competitions. So welcome back, it's me, Jessica McGovern, international multi-award winning portrait photographer. I have to date around about, well very, very, very slightly, a few numbers under 200 international image recognitions for my own working competition. And as most of you know, I'm also a judge. We run our own annual awards. And as of today, when this is actually being filmed, the results were announced for our annual awards about two days ago. So we've we've come off of an incredibly intensive period because for what you guys might not know, it takes a hell of a lot of work to run these competitions. And for the most part, it's a thankless task. So anybody who does do it, you have my full admiration. I wanted to sit down and do this because we see lots and lots of different things throughout our competitions. And when I judge others, there's a lot of common trends. And I think if people knew what they were, everybody would have a better chance for success. And also, I, I think it might help to demystify things if you haven't achieved the success that you wanted to. So hopefully within these 20 different things that I've conveniently split into different little sections, you should end up with a fuller understanding of what may or may not be going on. And if you're getting ready to submit for a competition, you should set yourself up for the best possible chance of success. So I could go on about my credentials. I'm not going to. You should be able to see in the background some trophies and rosettes and stuff. All of those are from photography competitions. I'm not going to go into my backstory. Just know that I have worked really, really hard to try and find my own success in different competitions. And throughout that process, I've learned a lot. And what I've also learned is that not everybody likes competitions. So before we jump into this 20, let me just say, if you don't like photography competitions and you think awards are stupid, then you can just go away. I mean, I'm just gonna be that straightforward today because everybody likes different things. Some people like coffee, some people like tea. That doesn't mean that because I don't like coffee, I'm gonna go out and attack people who do because that's weird different strokes for different folks just because you don't like it doesn't mean someone else won't so yeah truth hurts right sorry if that was a bit firm but i just have got no patience for people being mean to the people for no apparent reason so that's that right so <laughs> With that out of the way, let's jump in. So the first section that we're gonna go through is submission errors, okay? Submission errors, I'm gonna keep this uh, hopefully as short as possible, but it's gonna be quite a long video anyway. Submission errors include lots of different things. So my first set of errors that may or may not happen are to do with the files. So in terms of the first and the main ones that are easiest to get right, but also most frustrating if you get wrong, you have your file conventions. The first one is a file type. Before I run through these, let me just say why this is important because it might be confusing if your image gets disqualified for one of these reasons that we're about to go through. And from an organizer's point of view and from someone who has gone through the whole process before is basically these exist to ensure that the organizers can facilitate either rewards or awards in terms of if somebody wins something, maybe they get a printed copy of their whatever it is if the winners or successful ones end up in a magazine or if there is an awards book, for example, or an exhibition, all of these things would need to have a submission of a certain quality and a certain file type. And that's why these exist. And your image is disqualified if it doesn't meet these criteria because quite simply, the organizer can't contact you to ask for a correct file type before the results have been announced, yet that's when all this prep work gets done. So that's why these exist. Okay, that's just why they exist. So the first thing is a file type. It's a JPEG in most cases, but do check. You can read the rules five or six times, make notes, make sure that you have everything, all your ducks in a row before you send to print or send to the competition if it's digital only. So most of the time it's a JPEG file. Okay, that's the first one. The second thing is usually dimensions. Usually there will be a dimension requirement and that is in pixels. So in most cases, it is around about 3000 pixels. Sometimes it can be 4,000 pixels on the longest side and sometimes it can be 2,000 pixels. Now, some organizations want you to have your files at that dimension. So that is what you have to send in. Others require that that's the minimum, which means if it's bigger than that, it's fine. Send it in anyway. And usually it's the longest side. So that is another thing. Again, it has to be a certain size to be able to do all of those things that I've just mentioned. The next thing is most of them will ask for high resolution files, high resolution JPEGs, high resolution industry standard JPEGs, whatever it might be. 
if you don't know what any of these terms mean, you could just Google them because Google usually has the correct answers for these. But a high resolution JPEG is 300 DPI or 300 PPI. I will get into that today. A web resolution file, for example, would be 72 DPI or 72 PPI. And in these cases, again, same thing. We can't print the successful entries and, and so the same situation happens again. So that's resolution. So high resolution is 300 DPI. So just go with that. That's fine. You don't need to go really any more than that. You could probably sneak some in lower than that, maybe down to 250, 240. But any lower than that, it starts to become a little bit iffy if the prizes include large format printing or exhibition work that's going to be really big. It needs to be the right resolution. There's no two ways around that. The next one is file sizes. So usually there's a maximum file size. Sometimes there's a minimum as well. So it could be a minimum of four meg. It could be a maximum of 20 meg. It could be a maximum of 10 meg. It could be, it, could, it doesn't really matter what it is as long as you know what it is and make sure your file comes in around that point. Usually this is to do with the entry software rather than anything afterwards, but it could be to do with something afterwards. I don't know. Just make sure that the file size is also correct. And then the final part that I'm going to put still under error number one, if you get the file submission wrong, is the file naming convention. So naming conventions exist for a very simple reason that it helps for um, winners organization, entry organization, and the ability for an organizer to find people's files really, really quickly for the purpose of web galleries or for print or whatever it might be. So file naming conventions are really important. Some organizations don't have a file naming convention. That's fine. You can name your file whatever you want in that situation. Others will ask that it's your name. So in my case, it would be Jessica McGovern.jpg. Others may be to, including the category. Others might include a membership number. There's lots of different file naming conventions. It's very easy to change the name of any file. So make sure you have this right before you submit. And that wraps up error number one. Error number two that comes within the submission section is leaving an identifier on the file. So identifiers are watermarks, names, anything that it, it could be used to identify you as the photographer visible on the file itself. So you can't leave things like that on there. Make sure you don't leave a watermark on. I know it's so frustrating if you accidentally did and then you've been disqualified, but it's just the way it works. You can't have an identifier on your file. Error number three is all about entering into the wrong category. So this I understand is really hard because some categories and some awards don't have places for your work, I guess. Like it's not obvious where to put the picture and maybe your image could suit multiple categories. So which one should you enter? This is uh, a gray area and one that realistically I can't help with without knowing the exact situation. But in most cases, this becomes an error when you enter your image into a category where it should not exist. So some category descriptions will have what can be entered in there and what should not be entered in there. Others will have stipulations on how much retouching can be done, for example. If you enter your image into the wrong category, the organizer is usually well within their rights to disqualify the image from competition. And often in certain categories, they will request raw files. I have had raw files requested. We requested lots of raw files this year as part of our competition. So be prepared to provide evidence if required of why your image should sit in that category. But at the same time, some competitions will move your image if the organizer feels like it should be in a different category. And sometimes judges also will request that the image be considered for a different category because it may do better there too. So just make sure your category is right if you can. Under the submission errors, I also have number four, which is titling importance. So the importance of a title is very difficult to understand until you're a judge, and then it becomes really obvious. So people are, and you are 100% within your rights to title your image as untitled, literally using the word untitled as the title of the file. If you do not want to give it a file, if a title doesn't really fit the file, it doesn't really make a difference. But what I will say is from a judge's perspective, having that title there is really, really useful to understand the narrative that the photographer wanted the image to take and it can drive the narrative home. So narrative is part of storytelling 
And those are elements within the judging criteria in most cases. So the title actually is really, really important for the overall success of an image. And it really does pay to have a really good think about what are you trying to portray in this image? What does this image give you? What's the feeling? What's the vibe? What do you want the judge to feel when they look at it? Or what's the narrative? What is the story that's going on within the image? And then give it an appropriate title that fits that. Because sometimes we can look at an image as a judge and be like, I'm not quite sure what's going on here or why this was done. And then the title just makes it all make sense. And so it's really important to pick a great title. Error number five is a little bit different because it's not about one file. Error number five is entering a series of images as individual entries. So not if there's a series option, it's like an individual one. So an example of this would be you've gone out for a photo shoot and you think it was a great shoot. You had the best shoot ever and you've ended up with maybe seven images that are really, really good and you're happy with all of them. And you maybe can't pick which one is the best image. So you just enter all of them into the competition. I'm gonna say this very clearly. I'm even gonna move closer to the microphone to do so. Please don't do this. Don't submit multiple images that are quite similar, either in location or in the subject or both in worst case scenario, because and I'm saying this genuinely to hopefully give the best options that you can have available. By the time the judge has seen the third one, the impact has gone and the scores drop. And you never know what order the judge will see the images in. So you could have one image that would have been really, really, really strong and could potentially have won a category, but because you've entered seven images, Maybe the judge has seen six of them from the same series before they saw the one that could have been the strongest. And then what's going to happen is by the time they've got to the seventh, the impact is gone and you will lose out on the points that are sat there that could have been taken for that section of the judging criteria. So just pick the best picture that you possibly can from the series and try to keep it as unique as possible. If you only have your own family, dogs, animals, sheep, I don't know, to photograph, then the subject is going to be quite similar in all of your pictures. But that doesn't mean that you can't make everything else as different as possible. And it doesn't mean that you can't pick your best shots only for the competition. So don't enter as a series unless you have a series entry option. And that wraps up files. So let's move on to section two, which is technical errors. Error number six is probably the single most frequent error and it's seen at all levels of competition. And I know personally from the awards that we run, the TOG Awards, that we have had hundreds of entries with this error. And unfortunately, it means that the image immediately cannot move forward through the judging cycle because the single most important part of the image is not there. And that is the focus on the subject. So let me be very specific about this to hopefully make this as helpful as possible. If you have a animal, of any species in your image, the eyes of that animal must be the sharpest point of the image, okay? If there's two animals in the image, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, both of those animals' eyes must be the sharpest point of the image. So they must both be super sharp. You can't have one that's completely out of focus in most cases and one that is. You also can't realistically expect good success at the top level with images where the nose is the sharpest point of the image or the top of the head is the sharpest point of the image and the eyes are soft or worst case scenario when they're completely out of focus. With action shots, I know it's really hard. I know that we've gone through action so many times and people always struggle with it. It's really hard and you might have the best moment but if the chest is in focus and the face is out of focus, the image cannot go and do well in competition. It just isn't going to happen. So always make sure that you have the eyes in focus in the image if it's of an animal. In most portrait situations and especially in studio, dogs' noses should realistically be in focus also in the image. Now, I don't like giving it a hard and fast rule, but, but you have to cover the bases for all of the judges. So it's worthwhile considering just in this situation. I just want to caveat on this actually and add it on. And I know it's going to add time. Don't get angry with me. The other side of this that I think is really important is the fact that if the face is out of focus and you try afterwards in retouching to sharpen it, it is obvious to a judge that that has happened. 
So an experienced judge will be able to see that from a mile off and it won't it won't help the image. It won't it won't push the image through. So it's worthwhile just leaving that picture, trying again if you can, or finding an image where the eyes are in focus. If we're gonna get into it really quickly, essentially if you try and sharpen it afterwards, either using one of the AI tools or using some tools in Photoshop, for example, all you're gonna be left with is soft mushy bits and over sharpened edges. And it's it's just it, it we can tell. We can tell. So it's just best just to not do that. Okay. Error number seven sitting under technical is chromatic aberration. We've talked about this before. I'll go ahead and link a video above to fringing, talking about fringing, which is chromatic aberration, same thing. And essentially it is a bright pink, usually sometimes purple or green, sometimes blue line that appears around the edges of stuff or on things. And usually the high contrast, that video talks about it in a lot more detail. Its presence in images will result in the image failing on technical grounds. Tying into this, and I'm going to put it in the same camp, is haloing, which often exists in landscape photography or photography that contains landscapes. And this is usually seen where an area of dark stuff, like a cliff face, for example, meets the sky. And what this does is creates a line around the subject that's much, much, much lighter. It's a normal thing, but it does need to be corrected for competition purposes. Error number eight is all about blown highlights. So you guys, hopefully, if you've been following me for the last few years, will know that highlights are really important to have control of. A blown highlight, as you guys will also know, is a highlight that's got no detail or data left in it and is completely white. Now, I'm gonna link a video above to histograms. Histograms, this video will talk about some blown highlights and bits and pieces and how to check and make sure that yours are okay. But in the purposes of competition, what we're also looking for is a high level of finesse on the highlight control and you may receive feedback that says the highlights are blown in the image even if they're not got the blinkies they're not flashing we haven't got any problems there and what it means basically is the judge cannot see the level of detail in that highlight so it's essentially in their view a blown highlight because remember a blown highlight is a highlight that's got no visible detail so in the case of an example a horse's head with a white stripe on it. If the white stripe has got no hairs in it, you can't visibly see the hairs in it. The highlight for the judges is blown. And that detail needs to be there to show that you have exceptional technical skill, which is required for high levels of success in competition. So blown highlights, be careful, keep them under control. The last one in technical that I'm going to include here is incorrect white balance with no cause. So I've added that extra section on the end because it is important. So the image could be, for example, really heavily blue toned because it's a moody nighttime scene and you need the blue to be able to tell the story. And therefore the white balance technically isn't incorrect for that purpose. The narrative needed it. There is cause for the white balance to be weirdly off. If the image is just blue with no cause, then it's an incorrect white balance. Your image will be pulled up on technical grounds. Moving into section three, my favorite section is retouching errors. Unfortunately, these are the most obvious for most judges to see, especially ones who have got a long period of, of retouching expertise. So these ones are, are the ones that are the most frustrating for judges. I find it personally because the images are often exceptional and we have to fail them essentially because of these minor errors that could have been completely avoided. So it's not the case that something else has gone wrong somewhere else. It's literally 100% avoidable. And that's really frustrating for us just as much, well, probably not as much as it is for you, but it still is, uh, it's gutting, it's gutting. So the first one is cloning repetition. We've talked about this before. I'll go ahead and link a video about cloning repetition, how to avoid it above. And that's also gonna touch on the next error that I'm gonna add in here as well. So the cloning repetition is basically an area of visual repetition that we can see in the image that's not from natural causes. So usually using the clone stamp, but also other tools have the effect as well. For example, content aware fill, content aware move, you've got the healing brush tool, patch tool, spot healing brush tool, all of these can cause cloning repetition. So it's worthwhile keeping an eye on it and making sure it doesn't happen. Fine to clone, fine to heal. Just make sure that the areas don't completely match. So do a little bit of, well, just watch the video I've just linked. It would be easier than me explaining all of this. The second error inside retouching is all about broken focal planes. And it's usually caused by those tools I've just mentioned. So focal plane breaks are frustrating and 
what we mean by that is briefly, because it's touched on in there, is in the image where you've got an area of like blurry foreground, and then you'll have the really sharp bit where the subject is in, because that's the depth of field that you've got, and then it goes back to the blurry background. What a focal plane break is, is if there's a blob or area of blurriness in the sharp strip, or for example, if it goes blurry sharp, blurry sharp because that wouldn't happen. So that's focal plane breaking. It's a retouching error. You'll be pulled up on it in competition if the judges are able to see it clear enough and if they look in that area. So yeah, sadly I'm picky Patricia. So it's my favorite thing to look for, sadly. Gutting, isn't it? I'm gonna have a sip of tea. We're on error number 12 now, still in the retouching section, and this one is mask errors. I have done a video, I don't know how many I've got left, so I'll try and link this one above, if not, it'll be down below, to retouching or touching up masks that already exist within the image, because I know people do struggle with that. A masking error can present in a couple of different ways. The primary one is an area around the subject, for example, if we're talking about a dog around the ears, around the nose, on the legs, it could either be a sharp mask or just a bad mask. And if it's a bad mask, it just means that there's an area that hasn't been masked well enough and it's a retouching error. It causes a distraction which moves the center of interest. So it's not a case that the error exists. It's the case that it directly influences the 10 judging elements, but I'm not gonna go into those today either. So in terms of the other type of masking error is usually straight line mask edges and they can happen in composites or just when you're masking, if you accidentally move a mask, often they tend to happen around the edges of the frame. That's where they tend to exhibit more because it's easier for us to miss as creators when that happens. So just triple check all of your edges, make sure that there is no straight lines running through the image anywhere where there shouldn't be straight lines running through the image. If you have a problem with this, you'll know. You'll know when you find it. Error number 13 is overprocessing, which is different from good heavy processing. Let me explain this really quickly if I can. So images can be heavily processed, like heavily, 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 heavily processed and still not be overprocessed. Okay, just the same as an image can be very lightly processed, but overprocessed. So I think what we mean by this in the most simplistic terms that hopefully will help the most amount of people is has the image gone well past the realms of normal? Like, does it look natural? Does this look like it could have happened in real life under a certain lighting condition, for example? Does the light make sense is another one. And the most common part, I guess, that, that is often overprocessed if we're looking at intricate details is eyes. Eyes are often overprocessed the most because they're lifted to look radioactive. We've talked about this before with some of my pictures. So they're lifted to the point where they look radioactive. So just because it's heavily processed doesn't mean it's overprocessed, but it's very easy to overprocess an image if you don't have the control and finesse to see when to stop or when to change or when to come back so on and so forth. So that's over processing. Now over sharpening, I'm going to tie in with this one because over sharpening is a frequent issue in competition. So over sharpening, we've talked about that. I can't link it above because I will have run out. So I'll link it down below instead about over sharpening and when to stop with your sharpening. If the image is over sharpened, it becomes distracting and it's trend at the moment, I think, to over sharpen images and in competition, they just won't do very well, again, because of the elements that it will impact from an experienced judge's eye. So hold back on your over sharpening, check out that video, it's all in there. Number 14 and the last one I'm gonna include in retouching is banding. Now I'm gonna classify this as digital banding. In judges feedback, you might hear it referred to as artifacting, it depends. It, banding is a print error technically, but banding is what we all kind of know this situation as. So this is where usually there's a vignette that's been applied or a radial that's been applied and you end up with like these rings that go round and out. They're kind of like hard rings. That's banding or digital banding or artifacting. One of the many artifacts that can be pulled up on in technical judging, but from a retouching standpoint, usually it's avoidable. So I do have a video on banding on the YouTube channel. However, I'm not going to link to it because I don't like showing people how to fix it after it's happened 
it's far more important to learn how to not let it happen in the first place. So this is a common thing that we see. Just be careful to not have banding present in the image. Check your vignettes, check your radials, check your final JPEGs. So section four is not necessarily an error. It's more of an expectation issue. And I'm hesitant to include these in and the next section after this because I think it could be... I don't know. I'm just going to include them because I think they're important. Okay, so the first one in this section, so this is number 15 and is an expectation issue, is a lack of understanding about what the judges experience. And I will be 100% honest and say that this totally applied to me. And now I understand, <laughs> I understand. And it's so hard for me to explain what it's like. As a judge, we can see over a thousand pictures a day um, if you're doing the 14 hour judging days that, that I tried to do for a bit. In terms of when you see that many pictures in a day, especially if all of those are over maybe two, two, three categories, you end up seeing a lot of really, really, really similar pictures, okay? I'm gonna use the example, I think, in this instance that hopefully is most relevant for the audience that will probably watch this, is um, pictures like this. So this picture, um, so over my shoulder here, is a dog running straight towards the camera, okay? This is what, if there was a pet action category or action or pets category, the chances are that the judges will see hundreds of pictures like this. And when it gets to that point, if you think about the judges criteria, if they're using one, there will be stipulations over perhaps originality or creativity or even things like in the 10 judging elements there is like a style part and if they all look the same those are failure points for the picture and I know that's really hard to talk about I mean I entered that's been in competition that got a merit great perfect but I, I think it would be silly of me to expect for that to win because it's it's not new it's nothing unique it's not gonna blow the judges socks off in terms of the impact sadly so it depends on what your expectations are when you're entering but if you're entering to win, the image has to be unique with impact. That's probably the most important thing. And then also meet all of the other bits that we've just talked about. So it depends what your expectation is. If you just want to do really well and get maybe a really solid merit, putting in a really solid shot, regardless of if there's something similar to it, is probably achievable. And so you shouldn't not enter for that purpose, but just expectations. Expectations. Number 16 is under expectation as well. And this is about different competitions having different criteria. So an image may do really, really well in one competition or one organization's competition and then not do very well in a different one because the judges criteria is different. So if the competition is a good competition and a well-run competition, the judges will have a document usually given to them with guidance and their judging criteria, which stipulates what they should reward with what basically. So what the organization is looking for, how they expect certain things to be scored and so on and so forth. And some organizations have got really stringent ones with specific score bands that you can't go up or down from unless something is or isn't present, if that makes sense. Um, and others are really, really general. So if the competition is judged by an experienced judge or multiple experienced judges with judges training, they're gonna be looking at probably the 10 judging elements and then tie in the guidance and the, the criteria that's been given to them by the organization. If the images are just being judged by photographers, just normal photographers, without judging training, then what you'll tend to find is a different type and different set of images are rewarded because they're not, they're just not, they're just not looking at the same things, basically. Um, for the most part, they are. The great images still end up doing well, um, but it's just, it's just not the same. It's just not the same. It's just not the same. And even if they do have judges training and they do have the same criteria, different organizations reward different things. So my image that's just most recently and just gone in March won um, another title. That image, if I entered it into a certain competition would probably maybe get a merit but nothing more than that because it doesn't fit what they're looking for so most organizations don't have a style that they reward but some do some definitely do so it's worthwhile being aware of them and section five that i just want to dip into really quickly isn't anything to do with errors or expectations but it's more reminders for good etiquette for competition it pains me that i feel like i need to say this but I will, I will say this and I, I, know, I know I might lose some friends for this. I'm okay with that because I think it needs to be said. 
right? So the first thing is not everybody is aiming to win. And this is important. Some people are aiming to achieve a merit. Some people are just aiming to get into the final scoring round. Some people are aiming to win. Some people would like a category win. Some people want a 90 plus. I'm a 90 plus person. I don't really mind if I win or not. I just really, in most competitions, I'd love to get over 90. It's total accolade to achieve that level of score. It's incredible and it's a great feeling. So when I don't get that, I'm a bit disappointed. What I don't do is go on social media for the most part or into a room of people at these events and start saying loudly that um, an 89, oh, I got an 89. What absolutely horrendous score. I don't understand why anybody would even want that. Like, oh, what a letdown. I'm so disappointed and so on and so forth. Um, no, no, to, please don't do that, guys. It is so deflating if you as a photographer was happy to achieve your 78 and then hear someone say things like that because it makes you feel like you failed. And I know that the people saying this don't have a responsibility to protect the other people. You do have a responsibility to be a nice person though. So just consider how what you say might come across to other people. I know a lot of people won't do that, but it's important to me and therefore I feel like I should say it. So there's that. And then the second part of this, which I'm gonna tie in is always congratulate the winners with genuine sincerity. And if you can't congratulate the winners with genuine sincerity, don't say anything at all. Tip number 18 is just because you didn't do well doesn't mean the competition is shit. I should have done a swear warning in front of that. I'm so sorry. Just because you did not do well does not mean the competition itself is, is a failure, all right? It just doesn't, it just doesn't. And I'm gonna tie into this as well, comments along the lines of, oh, well, uh, your competition just doesn't award my style of work, for example. Let me caveat that with, some competitions may not award your style of work, right? This is the truth. But, but by and large, correlation does not equal causation. So just because you did not do well does not mean the competition itself and its integrity should be called into disrepute, okay? That's unfair. And for the most part, probably something on the rest of the list of stuff that I've talked about will be at play in why your image did not do well. The other side of this is nobody likes a sore loser, even if you're really disappointed, which I mean, I've been there. Oh my goodness, I've been there so many times and I've been so disappointed because I thought this image was the one and, and this should be the right one. If I then am not successful, I don't then say that the competition is wrong and the judges are wrong and the judges are rubbish and that the winner, because this is the important thing, because you saying that directly says that the winner is not worthy of that of that award or reward. Um, and that's where I personally think it goes quite nasty. So don't do that. That's another thing, I'm sorry. So number 19 is important to me. Number 19 is if you receive judges feedback, please cherish it. I know it's really hard sometimes to hear feedback that you don't like, and I'll be the first to say that it can be disappointed, disappointing, but if the feedback is delivered in a positive way, please cherish it. If it's meant with the best intention, which 99% of the time it is, please cherish it. As long as that judge has not called into question personal things and said that they you know, just don't like the picture, which is a bit mean um, and would never be said by a trained judge. If it's feedback, that's been written or given by a judge, it will have taken time. The judges are not paid for the most part. Most places do not pay judges. It's a voluntary thing that you do for the good of the community to pass on your expertise and basically to just give back. So they're not paid for their time and feedback takes so long. Feedback takes longer than judging does to do. I know I myself, I have sacrificed more than I should have done over the last couple of months to give feedback to our entrance. I shouldn't have done that. I sacrificed things personally and that was a mistake and it's not one I'll make again. And I don't know if we're gonna do feedback next year. It's an insurmountable task to do feedback. Any judges feedback from any competition that you do, that you get for free or as part of your entry, goodness gracious me, just cherish it, cherish it. And you might not agree with it, I used to not, agree with judges feedback that I was that I received however hindsight is a wonderful thing and looking back they were so right on all of their counts so usually it's meant with the best of intentions and in most cases they're giving their feedback on the principle that you want to do well in competition so their feedback will be based around doing well in competition so it's not to change you or your style it's basically to give you a higher level of success so frame it like that in your head and blooming cherish it 
And reminder number 20 is if an image bombed in the competition, whether it's yours or someone else's, and you're like, oh, hang on, the winner's gallery is wrong because this picture did not get into it. Guys, there's probably a reason for that. I've just given you like 15 of them that may be the case in this situation. But the, the main reminder on this one is that often when you see the pictures on social media or on like the web galleries of the winners, you can't see them in the level of detail that the judges can. So often you can't see these little bits and pieces that, that we can pick up on. And, and also you don't have the criteria in front of you. So you don't have the judges criteria in front of you. You don't know the specific score bands and permissions and allowance and the areas that you're allowed and, and not allowed to score for as a judge. You don't have that. So again, correlation does not equal causation without knowing the intricacies, which to be quite honest, you'll never know because you don't see all of the entries. It's really difficult to make a judgment, but that is my 20. And I'm going to stop now because this has gone on for long enough. That is my 20. I hope that this video, which is also free and freely given, is taken in the spirit that it is intended to help as many people as possible to find their own version of success, whatever that might be. And I hope that people do still go forward and enter competition because competition for me is is great. I love it. I, ch I, I main, Mainly I compete against myself. That's what I do. And I try and outdo myself next year for what I did last year, if that makes sense. But I, I personally really do love the whole process of competition. And I like it most when it's transparent and I understand it. So hopefully this has helped with understanding and hopefully it helps some of you guys. And premium members will do a deep dive into some more bits and pieces in the future in terms of different competitions. And that's it. I'll see you soon.